Do the modern day players appreciate the bad cop? Are the younger generations coming through, are they different in the way that they expect to be managed? Oh, absolutely. You couldn't coach guys as I was coached. A little earlier this summer, we had the opportunity of recording one of the first detailed interviews with Munster Rugby's new head coach, Graham Roundtree. He spoke to us at length about his plans and ambitions for Munster, the pressures and the expectations. I need to look forward. I need to get us better under pressure. But I can only do that day by day, week by week. How will you do it? We'll wait and see. And I'm not asking you to give away too many <laughs> trade secrets. And no, I've got some strong ideas around how we operate within our environment, what the day looks like, what we stand for as a club. He's achieved an enormous amount in his playing career. Nearly 400 games as a prop forward for Leicester, when that club was at the top in England and Europe. Over 50 caps for England, two World Cup campaigns, and a tour with the British and Irish Lions. It's a long time since you've been playing, 2006 when you retired. Does coaching give you as much enjoyment and pleasure in rugby as playing did? Nearly. Nearly? Yeah, you just, you're a step away coaching, you're a step away. But you get all the highs and the lows. I love coaching. I knew before I finished playing, I wanted a coach. I was doing a bit with the Leicester Academy weekly. I just had a taste of it. I just loved getting lads better, being on the pitch with them, getting them ready for the weekend, having the crack with them, sitting down one-on-one -on -one with them. I still have that now. One of my favourite parts of my job now is one-on-ones, talking to a lad. How are you doing? How's things at home? What do you think about your game? But ultimately getting lads prepared for a massive game mm. at the weekend. The highs and lows involved with that. I can't think of doing anything else as a career. And the highs and lows as a coach, how do they compare to the highs and lows as a player? <laughs> Just the same. Just, I've had incredible lows as a coach. I got sacked by England after the 2015 World Cup. I had incredible highs as a coach, winning Lions series, etc. So you've got to learn from everything. As long as you're learning, moving on, that's good with me. What do you learn more from though? The wins or the losses? Losses. Why is that? There's going to be a reason for a loss. There's a mistake somewhere. You learn from that. Think, oh, I'm not going to do that again, or I won't let that happen to me again. So it has, I would say it has to be the losses. Graham, I was asking you about what you learned from disappointments and losses. So do you mind if I go back to two in particular? because it did strike me as a player. I mean, how did you get over the disappointment having been part of the Grand Slam winning team in 2003, not to go to oh, the World Cup? It took me a while. Um, it was hard. I must say that the, the day England beat Australia in that World Cup uh, final, I was playing for Leicester up at Rotherham and myself and Austin Healy were in a similar position. We were being left out late in the selection process. We're on a bus going up to Rotherham to play them with Leicester Tigers as our guys had just lifted the World Cup. We had a right uh, laugh to ourselves. It was, it was tough, but I came back and got a good majority of caps after that disappointment. I'm, I'm proud of that as a player. How did Clive Woodward let you down? Did he do it in a good way? Or yeah. Is there a good way to actually tell somebody they're not going to the World you know, Cup? It's no easy way. <laughs> he actually said, I think we, um, we'd finished the training camp on the Friday. He said, I'll be ringing you over the weekend. We knew it was final selection weekend. I'll be ringing you over the weekend. And he slipped in, obviously. Obviously, I'll be ringing the guys who were disappointed, first yeah. of all. So, Sunday morning, 9, 8.30 a.m., Clive Woodward. We all got his name and his number stored on our phone. That starts ringing. I thought, right, this isn't good news. And he gave me the reasons why. And you're never happy as a player. And, it's a, and I don't want players now being happy if I'm giving them bad news. I wasn't happy. Over time, a bit of reflection. Now I look back with, now with my coach's hat on, it was the right decision. Why was it the right decision? In terms of form, just purely in terms of form. I got, I'm at peace with it now. It wasn't easy for a few years, but I came back, I played for England after that. Toured with the Lions after that. That I'm proud of. Um, Did you come back a better player because of the things he'd said to you? It's questionable if you saw how I played the game, <laughs> my involvements in the game. Uh, but no, I came back. I'd say a stronger person, a stronger character. That was a good bedrock for the rest of my rugby career. Has it informed you though as how you will let players down when Massively. you actually have to make selection decisions? It armed me being in Clive's position. Because very, very quickly um, in my coaching career, I found myself in that same position, leaving guys out of World Cup squads, believe it or not. And it 
it helped me, it armed me to tell the players about, I know how you're going to feel. You're going to be all right. These are the reasons why, trust me, you're going to be all right as a player. But no, it helped in, on, on that front. But I'm, I'm at peace with it now. It wasn't easy at the time, Matt, but I'm at peace with it now. And then the 2015 Rugby World Cup and the disappointment for England. And the way that you've bounced back and Stuart Lancaster and Mike Catt and Andy Farrell. So tell us a little bit about what you learned from that particular experience and how did it change you? It's unfortunate circumstances. Very quickly you find yourself in a knockout game against Australia. And Australia there, they lost in the final. They were a brilliant team. Some great players. Um, we, we lost away against Wales in a pool game, massively, uh, towards the end of the game. Um, and then the pressure just grew. We had Australia the week after, and that became a knockout game. And, and all the pressure was literally on us. And you could feel within the week, the players felt that. Um, and then within that game, you, you, you sat there thinking, we're going to have a home World Cup here. And you think of the millions watching on TV, and the pressure is incredible. And then you had the fallout. Afterwards, embarrassment for everyone. But just roll back to me that week building up to the Australian game. If you realised the pressure was building, could you not have done more to alleviate that pressure or was it impossible? Hind hindsight's wonderful. I think if you ask all the coaches, we'd have done things differently. I certainly would have. But you, you learn about those experiences and how you felt in those weeks, how you felt in the game under pressure and making decisions under pressure. It's invaluable going forward. That's why I say you learn. You learn from the bad memories, you learn from the experience. I certainly learned a lot. It, it was a difficult time. Then you had the review process afterwards. Uh, Stuart went, then Eddie came in, and Eddie wanted to bring his own people in, which is fine. And then myself, Mike Cat, and Andy Farrell found ourselves uh, out of a job as well. Um, was it really fine, though? I mean, was it not hurtful that he didn't want to keep you on? No, I understand. He wants to bring his own people in. It, 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 don't get me wrong. <laughs> I wasn't cheering. I was shaking his hand and thanking him very much. No, it, it was tough, but if he, that's his prerogative, isn't it? He wants to bring his own coaches in, and they clearly were great coaches. I can't argue with that. Um, you've got to look forward. Uh, and, we all, and we all did, and we all found ourselves. It was never the grand plan to all end up in Ireland coaching, but we're here now. You took a scenic route, though, including Georgia. What did you learn from that? Georgia's wonderful. Have you been to Georgia? No. To Belize? It's fantastic. Real contemporary scene going on there, with nightclub in bars. It's a great country, good people. That, I, I, I took a job with Harlequins for a couple of years. Then I wanted something different. And that literally landed on my lap. Coached Georgia for a year into a World Cup. Experienced a different culture with different people. I wasn't based in Tbilisi. I, I'd go in there for three weeks, come home for a, a bit of time and go back. And then we did the World Cup, but incredible experience. What was it like with the language barrier? Was it any more difficult than understanding people here in Limerick? It's easier than understanding a Cork accent, a fast-speaking <laughs> Cork accent. Um, no, I learned. I learned. I learned the key words: um, how to order wine, um, scrummaging. Uh, no, I learned key words, but there's a lot of guys uh, would translate for me. Many Georgians speak four languages. Really enjoyed the culture, and it was an incredible experience. Uh, another one where you learn how to coach. What, because what you say has to matter. So you've got to be very brief. And, and there are different cultures to the Georgians. They don't like being told, you're not doing this very well in a team meeting in front of the mates, where well, you could do that to a lot of lads here. Say, no, you've got to do this better. A lot of the Georgians won't like that. So you, you learn about coaching styles and you've got to keep things minimal because of language barrier. They love scrummaging, don't they? They love their front row forwards and second rows. You must win your element with that. They, 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 they do. They love the wrestling. That's their number one sport. There's a lot of short square blokes in the country. Let's, let's agree that yeah, they do like scrummaging. It's a real culture. So, no, I, I, I learned a lot from them. When you came to Munster, though, how much did you really know about Munster? Because despite the fact that you'd played nearly 400 games for Leicester, you never played here in Thulman Park. I think you only played Munster once, was it, in that infamous 2002 Heineken Cup final? First thing that was mentioned to me in my interview here, that, the hand of back. Allegedly. Allegedly, we all, <laughs> That's what we all saw it. We allegedly. All saw it. Allegedly. Um, you weren't on the pitch at the time. No, I was it? subbed off by, the, uh, by that point. No, I played against Munster pre-season. Played in a, we played a, in, a, in a friendly at Welford Road before the 2000 European final. Um, Keith Ward was playing, Cloacy was playing against. Came over to Welford Road as a warm-up game for that final. 
But no, no I had a, a massive respect uh, from playing against Munster. But I'd say more having worked with Munster players. So I was very fortunate early in my coaching career to go on the 2009 Lions to work with Donica O'Callaghan and Paul O'Connell Rodge, for example. Played with Rodge in the 2005 Lions. And their attitude to the game, their character, their strength of character, I really respected. You can see what I can see Munster is what Leicester was. But I grew up in the Leicester, the Leicester setup. There's huge parallels bet between the two clubs. So to get an opportunity to come and work here, I jumped at the chance. What are the parallels between Munster and Leicester? What are the qualities that you mm. see in Leicester that are replicated in Munster and that you want to build on? There's a, it's a working class town club. There's a humility within the, the people who support the club and an expectation and a desire to get better. Just good, good people. It's just it's the same as the people I grew up with at Leicester. It's that humility, working class. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. Good people who just want to do better in life. Grafters. Grafters. Brilliant, Matt. Brilliant. Grafters. Yeah. What about expectations, though? You used the word expectations there. There are big expectations here in Munster, and it's been a long time since we've won a trophy. So how do you deal with that level of expectation? Get us better. Get us better every day. Get the lads better. Win every week. Control the things that I can. That's what I can do factually within my job. I can control the lads coming through, how we train to get them better and win at the end of the week. There is a huge expectancy and we're going to do better. We haven't won enough. We know that. Let's look forward. Why is that, do you think? Why has there been a degree of underperformance? No, it's not for me to look into too much at the moment. I, I, I need to look forward. I need to get us better. I need to get us better. Day to day, I, get, I need to get us better under pressure and win. But I can only do that day by day, week by week. How will you do it? We'll wait and see. And I'm not asking you to give away <laughs> too many trade secrets. And no, I've got some strong ideas around how, how we operate within our environment, what the day looks like. What the, what the lads are thinking about, what we stand for as a club. So now you've stepped up to be head coach of Munster, having been part of coaching teams most of the time prior to this. Why now at this stage of your career do you want to be a head coach? It has to be right. You've got to feel that it's the right time that you've got enough knowledge in the game. And, and the affinity I have with the club is right. And I feel I know enough about the game. I've been through enough experiences, the highs and the lows, and learnt. It just felt the right time. I, th I think that's important. If you'd asked me three years ago, I'd have maybe said, no, not quite yet. But the experiences I've had and the people I've worked with and what I've learnt, it feels right. What about the responsibilities that come with it? How would you define those responsibilities? <laughs> winning, winning every week, bringing players through. I'm comfortable with that. I've been around long enough and I've had enough experience to face up to those responsibilities and I'm looking forward to them. Will your relationship with the players change though? I mean, by reputation, you're very popular with the players. They like what you do mm. on the training ground. But now you're going to be the one ultimately who will be selecting them or dropping them or not selecting them. Is that going to change the way you get on with people, do you think? No, I'll be honest with them. I've always been honest with players. And that's not going to change. They know how I operate now. I'm comfortable having honest conversations with lads because I know them. We have a respect and a relationship already. OK, but if you're not going to change, is it the possibility that other people are going to change in their attitude and relationship to you because you are now the boss? I hope not. I, I, I think I've got a good enough relationship and an honesty with all the lads where I'll be able to tell them straight between him between the eyes. This is why you're not playing. Go and do this better or he's doing this instead of you. That's ultimately all I have to be is that transparent with them. I'm comfortable with that. How difficult though is it with the demands of winning that you have 15 players can start, you have eight on the bench. You need a big squad to deal with injuries and suspensions. So you're talking about 45 Suspensions, <laughs> Yeah. Well, will there be a lot of those? Our discipline's a big thing for you as well, isn't no, it? huge, massive thing. Not for giving me. away penalties. Yeah, um, I, say, I say to the lads every week three things. Discipline, work rate, belief. 
They're the three massive things you need every week. Discipline, work rate, belief. So that's important to me. If you're giving away a load of penalties, that's going to go against you. Would you drop a player if you're giving away a load Absolutely. of penalties? Absolutely, because we're going to lose a game. You know, factually, you'll concede a try with a yellow card. You know, we're, we're going to concede penalties, it's a problem. But then if you have 46 players, half of them are not going to be used on a particular week. How do you actually get players to buy into that belief that they will get a chance if they're doing well enough in training? The squad needs rotating. It's a long season. But I'm not, I'm not going to just pick willy-nilly all the time, particularly when you get to knockout games. Form counts. So that means when you get your chance, you've got to show me what you can do. I think ultimately every week, as long as a player, I remember this as a player myself, well, as long as I know where I stand in the pecking order and why, what I've got to do better, I'll be very frank as a coach and tell them what they've got to do better or what another player is doing instead of them. You had to let players go recently. End of season, players come to end of contracts. Some who hadn't been here particularly long move on. Others, maybe younger players who come up through yeah. the ranks. How do you deal with a situation like that? How do you look after perhaps young fellows whose dreams aren't actually working out? Tough decisions, but having a connection and a relationship with that player, every player throughout the season, caring about them, asking about them, but letting them know where they stand. That's all I can be as a coach is just being transparent, but showing them that, that all of them that we care about them. That's all that, it's all that matters. It's never, it's never easy letting players go, but at the end of the day, they understand it's, it's, it's a business as well. Now that you're head coach, you had to put together a coaching team as well of people to work with you. What do you look for when you're putting together that coaching team? Oh, good question. Lots of different things. Simplicity, um, a similar view of the game to me, um, good crack, and, and a history with the club that the guys will all know and respect. How important is that element of history, do you think? It's not the most important element, but it certainly helps with this club. That's, that's how I wanted it to look. I, I want a lot of Munster to come out and how we play. Um, so what is Munster as far as you're concerned? What is the definition? What makes Munster different to Leinster or Ulster or Connacht or to teams of England? Grafters. I like the expression of grafters. People have played here, understand the culture, the demands, the expectancy on the club. It's a huge following, huge province. Um, so people who have a connection and understand that, that's important but also guys who have a similar philosophy to the game as I do, and guys who will get on with me. What's the game about? Is it about entertaining? Is it about winning? winning. Is it about doing your best? It's winning. It's winning. Simple like winning. And the game now is, is, is a possession game, it's about keeping hold of the ball in the right areas of the field because, you know, it's a highly analysed game. Teams are looking at each other. Defences are better than ever before. I think of when I played the game, we didn't have defence coaches but now there's defensive structures that need breaking down. We're all about winning. Come back to me about the coaches you've picked who have a monster heritage, but how well do you know them? How are you going to develop relationships with them to get them working with you to get the objectives d delivered? Personally, I don't know them that well, but I've done an exceptional amount of homework on them from players who've played with them and coaches who've worked with them. That became very clear early on in the piece when I started speaking to them that they were the right people. Um, but I'm looking forward to having a tight group and getting to know them better. What happens if personalities don't gel? How do you deal with a situation like that? And this goes with players as well as with coaches. You're never going to gel all the time. You want healthy conflict. And I think that's my job as a head coach is to manage that. I don't want anybody sat in the corner being frustrated, but on the other side, I don't want to fight in every coach's meeting. Uh, no, that's up to me as a coach to manage that and to get the best out of these guys. You've worked with many big names in world rugby over the years. Yeah. You've had coaches like Clive Woodward, Ian McGeek and various others. Who would you have learnt the most from? Who do you think would inspire you the most that you might want to emulate? I've took a bit from all of them. From McGeek, and I worked with him early in my coaching career. Um, his warmth. I mean, I played under him as a 97 line. I had the guy next to him called Jim Telfer. And they were good cop, literally good cop, bad cop. I learned a lot from that dynamic. Geach is a proper carer as a coach. Warren Gatland, less is more is his mantra. Gets the best out of his players. Less is more in terms of meetings, in terms of training load. I learned a lot from him. Um, Martin Johnson, Andy Farrell. 
Stuart Lancaster, that dynamic. Uh, Faz is the reason why he was captain of Wigan at 19. He's a true alpha male and a, and a great coach. I learned a lot from him. He's younger than me. But, you know, I, I'd say all of us who work with Faz have learned a lot about how to deal with players, how to be firm with players. But he has an incredible warmth, warmth as a man. And he's doing a great job with Ireland. So I learned a lot from him. On top of all of that, Matt, I'm going to be myself. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to trust my gut instinct. Do you have the bad cop in you, yourself, or do you have somebody else to do that for you? Trying to suppress the bad cop, constantly. I have, I have, and that, those emotions I've got to control. Um, but no, I, I have, and that can come out appropriately. Do the modern day players appreciate the bad cop, or the younger generations coming through, are they different in the way that they expect to be managed? Oh, absolutely. You couldn't coach guys as I was coached. You couldn't have a Jim Telfer now, could you? Oh, I'd say you'd have to balance him up. And that's nothing against Jim, he, he did an exceptional job. But right? he was product of his time, maybe? He, he was, he was. And I don't have to coach as I was coached. That's important as well. You've got to be y yourself. But the bad cop can come out, but if it comes out every week, it becomes a dog, you, like this dog barking in the corner, eventually you stop listening, you ignore the dog. But if it's a big dog that <laughs> comes out every now and then, they'll listen. You've got to save those moments, the hairdryer. Save that for when it's appropriate, otherwise it's just not powerful. Do you have objectives set for your first season? From? As in, are you saying we are going to win a trophy? Or are you going to say that's a hostage to fortune? Get the lads better every day, win the next game. How about that? Game by game basis? Why not? Because I can control that. If we get that right, get the day right, get the week right, get that game right, we'll win. That leads to trophies. You used the Joe Schmidt expression earlier, controlling the controllers. You look horrified when I say Joe, 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 <laughs> Joe Schmidt. Joe didn't invent that saying. <laughs> I, I love Joe Schmidt. I, I read his book, fascinating book. Uh, no, that, that, that's all we can do day in, day out. Be what? yourself, control what you can. And what are the controllables as far as you're concerned? How we train, what our environment looks like, what the lads are thinking about, keeping things simple, what we stand for as a club. What are the uncontrollables? Opposition, media, media scrutiny, it goes with the job now. Injuries, bans, illness, COVID pandemics, you name it. Um, I'd say there's a few there for you. What do you think of the perception, and this is one that Munster fans may not like, but that Munster has fallen to number three in the rankings in Ireland, and Munster is now behind Ulster as well as been behind Leinster. We did lose to Ulster by a big scoreline in our last game. So it's difficult to argue against that. Again, it's controllables, isn't it, Matt? Perceptions, I can't, I can't control that. I want us to be the best team in, well, the best province in Ireland. That's all I can strive for.